after the girlfriend that left me when I was around 29, and I had this huge epiphany, like I really saw the matrix, I really saw the nature of life is uncertainty, and I'd been living through the human lens, which is trying to find certainty. When we transcend that, and we step into our true divine essence, and realize our worth, our abundance, our feeling of true love that is ours, not because of someone, then that becomes the precursor to all of those things starting to show up effortlessly around us. It's like a video game. Yeah, it might look like you lost the game for a minute, but don't worry, you can put some coins in and start over. But that could be the place to start to look is how are you perceiving what's gonna happen and start to consciously create a future that you can step into. You've got a pretty interesting story uh, yeah. growing up in Dover in the UK. Can you just give us a little montage of how you grew up and and um, and how you kind of found your way to that tennis camp in, in the States? Sure. Um, yeah, and it's appropriate timing because I actually just went on this sort of hero's journey return, you know, Joseph Campbell style to my family in Belgium. Uh, three weeks ago. I only have one living relative who is my mom's brother, my uncle. And I hadn't seen him for seven or eight years. And as part of a sort of a trip through Monaco, and then I went to Belgium, Amsterdam, I stopped off to, you know, do my own kind of reconnaissance on my childhood with them. And what was I like as a kid? And more than anything, I wanted to learn more about my mom and my dad. So to answer your question, you know, I was raised in a little village just outside the town of Dover. And my mom sadly passed of cancer when I was seven, um, which made my dad and I extraordinarily close, as you'd imagine. Um, but then sadly, he went to work when I was 17. He worked on the ferries that went between Dover and Calais and Dover and Zeebrugge. And he was part of a major disaster where one of these big boats, you know, capsized and close to a couple of hundred people were killed. And unfortunately, he was one of them. So he went to work when I was 17, never came back. So by the ripe old age of 17, I was orphaned and um, forced quite uh, dramatically into survival mode. Um, also, really contemplating the meaning of life and what was the point, you know, all of those sort of thoughts that people could probably have compassion for, like, what's the point of being here? I'm by myself. And so in ways that I didn't fully understand at the time, I was definitely um, prepared for a huge amount of compassion as it relates to the experience of isolation, right? So I was viscerally alone, but I would assert why it's afforded me the skill that I have to help people as I do is because our identity, our ego is alone, right? It's a separate entity why people struggle with depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations, worry, stress. And so Obviously, it wasn't fun to go through, but it was formative in the way that it created, as I said, this uh, incredible vigilance to start with, but it allowed me to become super observant of human behavior, human language, why people do what they do, um, which then, you know, that's the short version, but allowed me to become the mind architect and help uh, people get out of their own way. So, yeah, there were obviously many little anecdotes along the way, and I learned so many beautiful things from my uncle about you know, how much pain my mom was in. I didn't realize that she was really in pain for three years uh, with bone cancer. They tried everything. They did traditional radio, uh, radiation chemotherapy. She lost all her hair. I don't even remember that as a kid. Um, they went to Lourdes, you know, in France, the sighting of the Virgin Mary in the holy waters is sort of that last Hail Mary attempt to have a miracle. Um, so it was very, it was very moving to hear what she went through and equally what my dad was like during those periods, you know, and what they were both like is my uncle obviously could speak much more to who my mum was as a, as a girl because they grew up together and he loved her as a sister and said she was such a special woman. And it's just sort of nice to hear that validation of how I recall my parents because I think we can romanticize sometimes our childhood or superimpose even negative images of our parents like it's their fault you know because our life isn't working somehow so it was just really nice to hear that my interpretation of my parents as being incredibly loving was was pretty spot on yeah i haven't lost any parents or anyone close like that no siblings anything like that mm -hmm. um so i don't know what that is like but you know obviously we all have experiences that that uh leave an impression upon us and yeah. I remember when I was 13, my mom stopped celebrating my birthday for some reason. She just decided, okay, we're not celebrating birthdays anymore. 
and my wow. partner recently, we kind of, we kind of put two and two together and realized, cause I'm not a big birthday person. I could care less <laughs> about birthdays. Right. And I so why. I don't know if that was the experience that sort of caused me to shut, shut down on birthdays or just, or treat every day like my birthday. But I'm yeah. curious, having been orphaned or having had to reconcile your mom's death for 10 years before your dad passed away, did you find that as a result, you you made friends with everybody or you didn't make any friends because you didn't, were, weren't sure who's going to still be there? Like, how did it affect you emotionally or psychologically? Yeah, it's a great question. It was really pivotal, actually. So my first, tr what I considered to be love, you know, at the ripe old age of 28, 29, uh, as little as we know about what love is at that point, um, <laughs> you know, was a woman I met in Sydney, Australia. I was working for a VIP couple as a trainer back in the day. I was sort of sculpting bodies as opposed to, you know, uh, liberating souls at that time and minds. And so um, this was sort of one of those quintessential across the crowded room moments where we, you know, eyes locked and it was sort of us, our fate was sealed. And so there was a little bit of complication along the way. She was dating someone. I had some big epiphanies, let it go. She came back, you know, all the things. And then eventually she actually moved to the States with me from, from Australia. And it was beautiful. We dated for about a year and a half or we were together for a year and a half. And then one day she decided she was going to leave me. And so in ways that I equally didn't understand, I had, unbeknownst to myself, been living in my strategy of survival, which we all create as coping mechanisms from past hurt, right? My trauma of loss meant that I became the perfect boyfriend. Now, ironically, it wasn't too far adrift from who I consider myself to be as kind and generous and loving and sweet and you know, not abusive at all. I'm like a bit of a pushover, but uh, I took all of those attributes and kind of amplified them as a means of trying not to lose her, um, which of course, you know, the expression of fear will break its own heart, right? So my fear, which is of loss, got manifest because that's how the energetics of human manifestation works. And so it ended up being very painful, but equally the catalyst for, you know, without sounding too full of myself, sort of my version of an awakening when two months after she left, I realized, you know, the matrix of life and particularly my own idiosyncrasies of survival. And so that's how it influenced my life is I tended to be more of a recluse. So to your question about did I suddenly have tons of friends? I was very friendly and people enjoyed my company. But I think I was quite happy to sort of do my own thing. I enjoyed my own company. And I think perhaps as a survival mechanism, don't get too close to anyone for the fear of, you know, that heartbreak again. Um, but this was just so instrumental and pivotal, a real metamorphosis of my journey to see, wow, I had really been living in the narrative of loss and realized I hadn't lost anything. You know, my parents died and that didn't make it any easier, but the story of loss was being perpetuated versus the event of death had actually ended, you know? So I understood psychological time, the way that we manifest our own suffering and all of it. And that, that then became the precursor to me becoming the mind architect and uh, freeing people's minds. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right, thank you so much for helping out, and back to the show. So let's, I just wanna rewind the tape just a little bit, okay? Yeah. You, you moved to Los Angeles, um, you start this production, or you join this production company with a couple of your mates. That yeah. Doesn't go, that doesn't work out too well, and, uh, <laughs> but you're, 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 you have a degree in exercise physiology. So you start working at this gym. I was curious, why, why did you choose that particular gym in Malibu? Cause LA is full of gyms. Why, why that one? So, you know, without getting too philosophical, one of the things I say is we're not victims of life. We're beneficiaries of it. Right. So I would say why, because I'm a beneficiary of life. And so why was it that the friends that I moved to visit in LA having originally met one of them coaching tennis in upstate New York at a summer camp. He moved to LA. He knew he wanted to be involved in film production. So why was it that he lived in an apartment building in Santa Monica that had the manager of all the trainers from that gym in it? Right. So that's how is that, you know, I very much 
whether you say it was spiritually curated by myself at a deeper level or I'm really, you know, divine intervention. Um, he one day and I were just shooting hoops or goofing off. And he's like, dude, you're like shredded. You're in great shape. Like, what do you do? And I said, well, you know, I studied exercise physiology and human biology. And he's like, dude, I'm the manager of this gym, you know, and I have all these trainers. Like I could probably get you a job if you get certified. So I was like, all right, cool. That was easy. I'll get certified. And um, yeah, so then that's how I got to that gym, which then led to the VIP couples ex trainer who decided he wanted to leave because he had kids and it was too hard to be on the road making films all over the place. So he happened to be at that same gym. He went to the general manager, asked her to put forward a couple of trainers for the interview process. And I was blessed to be one of them. So that's how I just happened to have a, a roommate in the same shitty rent control apartment building that I ended up in. <laughs> did they say, did they ever tell you why they chose you out of, out of all of the uh, different applicants? Um, indirectly, you know, I think one of the, I think there's a couple of attributes that I carried that was appealing to this particular couple, which was, they were very dynamic. You know, the, the husband in particular loved sports activity and I was a tennis coach. I was a ski guide. Not only did I have training as a, a certification, but I had human biology, exercise physiology as a background. So there was an even greater amount of depth. And I think one of the things that really touched him because there was a series of interviews I went to before I met him. And uh, our first session together, he was on the lot at Sony. And uh, we went to the local gym in the Sony lot. And uh, I didn't let him lift any weights. And he was a little taken aback by that. And I said, I just held his wrist, for example. I had him lie on a bench and I held his wrist with a bit of resistance. And I said, you know, imagine you're doing dumbbell press. And, and it really, he was really both intrigued but also impressed because what i said to him is i said i'm here to help you be extraordinary and if i don't know how you move without weights it's certainly not incumbent upon me to put weights into your body or on your body without knowing if you're going to hurt yourself and i want to see your functional patterns and i think that was a ceiling you know attribute that helped um also the fact that i said i had these other um skill sets that, that was very appealing and you know and I like to think I'm a pretty decent guy to be around. So they were like, you know what? He's a good human being. <laughs> did you have a spiritual practice at the time? I did. Not, not, not as a declared practice. Um, I think, you know, uh, after the passing of my dad, I started to, I went to college a couple of years later. That got delayed because I didn't get the grades that was anticipated. So I kind of had to, in ways that, I don't even know what overcame me as an 18 year old to pick up a phone and call a college that denied me twice already and talk my way in, uh, you know, that, that I'm impressed with. If that was my son, I'd be like, damn, cause I always was very shy. But anyway, so when I went to college a couple of years later, so this is, you know, about seven, eight years subsequent to this job that I got, um, I met, I met a friend of mine called Guy. Um, I didn't know anyone at the college. I hadn't even visited the college. I just had an intuition that I was meant to be there. And um, this is he low, low, and low, I, Loughborough, how do you say Lough, it? Lough, Loughborough, yeah. It's like Loughborough. Worcestershire shores. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Loughborough. Um, so it's in the Midlands and I did my undergrad and I stayed and did a postgrad in IT. And um, so, yeah, when I got there, you know, it was sort of very much just get to know people. And I was an athlete, so I got involved with the sports teams and got to know people that way. But one of my favorite um things to do was we'd literally as so so, sounds so cliche, but sit under a tree with this friend of mine, Guy, and we would discuss the nature of consciousness. And I literally found some notes uh, a few months ago, going through some old boxes that were his sort of, and I, you know, vacillations about who we are, why we're here. And so that became a spiritual practice in conversation. It wasn't like I was a, uh, disciplined meditator or anything like that. We would talk about those things. But um, yeah, I was really exploring these deeper, meaningful questions at the ripe old age of 19 or so. So by the time I got to this job, which was quite the extremes of materialism, um, you know, it was nice to know that I, I didn't get caught up with that. And I'd have to say that was another part to your question about why did they pick me? Because how would I phrase this? Whilst I was obviously respectful of who they were, I wasn't impressed, right? 
I just saw two human beings who, you know, did a job, made a lot of money, millions of people knew them, but they wanted to be healthy. You know, it's like, you know, fill in the blank. Every human being has those same kind of desires. So I think I was not phased. I didn't get, you know, in any way intimidated by fame. And I think that also led to a lot of other people who found me subsequently because I was like, yeah, yeah, you're a human being. You've got your own subconscious constraints to create your suffering and your idiosyncrasies and I can help. I remember when we met years and years ago, you would make reference to these these uh, quotes that you would come up with and collect yeah. in a box. Yeah. Is that back when you first started doing that with you and Guy sitting down and talking about these things? Did that Not to the to degree happen? that I have now. I mean, there were certain insights, but for whatever reasons, after the girlfriend that left me when I was around 29, and I had this huge epiphany, like I really saw the matrix, I really saw the nature of life is uncertainty. And I'd been living through the human lens, which is trying to find certainty, right? We were designed to survive. So the brain, which is always trying to predict and protect us, is really always trying to calculate, speculate and predict what's going to happen so that we can make it right. And when I saw the futility of that mechanism, you know, that life is uncertain. It's as asinine as saying, you know, well, no, fire's cold. It's like, no, it's not going to change, right? And life is not going to suddenly be certain, however much you try and sit and figure it out. So it was from that moment that it's almost like I became a clearing for all of these downloads, you know? Um, and that's when the real quotes came through me. I just, I don't know what it was. I just had these non-traditional ways of looking at life that transcended typical traditional thought, right? So it's sort of those things that go, wait, what did he just say? Like, I know there's something in that that I need to pay attention to. And so now I've got thousands of them. I mean, that is the format of my book that, you know, I've been working on for over a decade <laughs> is I write in quotes and then I expand on them. So yeah, I just, I love quotes. I love distinctions and insights. I think it's, it's, it's so powerful to be able to read something in a matter of three to five seconds and have an epiphany or see something you've never seen before. Um, and so I've, so far, people seem to love it. They share them a lot on social media. So, Well, it's one thing to kind of, you know, imagine what being a high performer would be like. But when you're close in proximity to a couple of very high performers, like you said, people all over the world know them. You see things, you, you, you connect certain dots that maybe you would not have otherwise. So I'm just curious, what did you learn about operating at that level from being in that environment for five years that you wanted to take away? And what did you learn that you probably, you know, would rather not have in your life? Great question. Um, I don't know if anyone's asked that question, but it's beautiful. Um, so I think given that I came from a very small village in the southeast can of England, orphaned, not left a penny. Even when my dad died, I, he did actually then have a, uh, uh, he didn't get married, but I had a stepmom who I wasn't particularly close to, but everything that he had, which wasn't much, went to her. So I literally came to the States with, I think, 250 bucks or something. Um, so one of the things that I did see is the extremes of abundance and what that affords you in terms of what becomes available and possible, right? Like, so my first... My, after my first interview, I was flown the very next morning to New York because the wife was uh, filming there. And the way that things were handled was so exquisite, right? Which I appreciate, you know, because I always prided myself on my organization. I'm a Virgo, so I have many of those stereotypical characteristics of order and efficiency. You know, so by the time I'd had the interview at Sony, I got home within 25 minutes. There was showing my age a fax, you know, <laughs> with my flight itinerary, what time the car was picking me up. I got to the hotel on the hotel bed. There was per diem money laid out. There was an invitation to a show that night. And so I knew I was in the right place because that's how I like to live life. Now, do I do it a hundred percent of the time? No, of course I'm going to have my lazy days. But so that was one thing that I really, um, garnered to another level of impeccability, integrity, uh, efficiency, discipline, and particularly the the man, you know, we could argue that he didn't have to prove himself by virtue of his status in the in the world. And yet his level of dedication was incredible. I mean, both of them, but 
that was that was really inspiring to me is that even when you've made it don't let rest on your laurels don't take things for granted and so that inspired me to keep becoming the best and that's why i became a yoga teacher i became a pilates instructor which they loved right because it gave them even more faculties to play with as we sort of refine their vitality in their bodies so i just wanted to keep becoming quote unquote you know the best version of me so that much of that is uh, off the coattails of his and her dedication um i can also remember one day which was very profound i was in sydney just at the turn of the millennium and I was getting paid a decent amount because of who they were and certainly more than I was making as a trainer and definitely way more than I had before that working in a bar in the Santa Monica Pier. <laughs> <laughs> but because of the nature of the job, I couldn't really spend the money, right? I had my apartment taken care of. I had a car, I had a phone, I had all my bills were managed. Um, you know, it would just be anecdotal if I wanted to get food here and there. So I managed to put a bit of money away in the stock market got some good tips. And that was back in the time where you could pick any kind of digital stock, you know, and you look like a, a professional day trader, you know. And so I can remember one morning, I'm 29. And my portfolio just ticks over a million bucks. Right. And I probably started with 200 something grand that I'd save really hard to make. So I'd 5x in about a year or so. And, and as I sat there, I'd also received three boxes from Oakley, big boxes, maybe four. And within those boxes was everything from about 40 pairs of sunglasses, you know, I don't know, a couple of dozen pairs of shoes and a bunch of clothes because that was part of what I did was help sponsor or they sponsored me, you know, got stuff on these celebrities to wear and blah, blah, blah. And as I sat there, I was like, so grateful that here I was with a an apartment that overlooked Sydney Harbor. I could see the opera house, the bridge. I just got a million bucks in my, uh, my stock market account. And I got all this free goodies, you know, and not just anything, but free, real, really good shit, you know? And then I laughed and I said, that's nothing compared to what's happening across the street at their house. <laughs> you know? And so it was the beauty of perspective that, you know, I'm getting free sunglasses, most of which were for them anyway. They're getting free cars and, you know, whatever. Like, it was just a whole, there's different levels. Like, you know, there's that song, there's levels to this shit, right? So, um, and it was also super humbling because within, I think, about six months of that, I lost everything, right? Because the stock market crashed. I didn't know what I was doing. I just picked some, you know, fortunate stocks that happened to, I think, one of them 20 x or something. And, um you know, and then I went back to just sort of the traditional do the right thing, work hard and rely on my talents and, and my dedication to being a caring human being who's making a difference. So so there was a lot that transpired in that where I learned, as I said, the dedication, the discipline. I got a glimpse of abundance for myself that then also went, which then really pulled from my deeper resources of not giving up and not being a victim of life again um, and picking up from scratch. and. Um, yeah, so there was so much to be grateful. And also, I'd say the degree to which he particularly, again, really sought counsel from people who were the best at what they did. In lay terms, not being scared to ask for help, right? Because having been orphaned, I became, you know, no shock, a bit of a lone wolf, right? And I, like you, birthdays didn't matter. I don't know how many Christmases I've spent by myself because that's what I became accustomed to. And I figured a lot of things out. I became incredibly smart, resourceful, and studied a lot. But it was beautiful to see that he wasn't scared to ask for help, which I think particularly for a man is, you know, a bit of a uh, rite of passage to overcome that, you know, um, the quintessential example being directions in a car, although I guess men are off the hook from that one because you will have your phone now. <laughs> Um, so that there was a lot that I garnered from that. And then with regards to the second part of your question of what I wouldn't want to take from it, I don't know, you know, I dabbled with the whole idea of fame, um, and how intrusive it is. Um, I think how scary it can be for some people, uh, especially having, they had kids and that was something that. I kind of in a funny way knew that I was my own version of them, you know, without being conceited. I wanted to be humble, but knew that I had a gift. And 
sort of reconciled that, you know, and I felt there's a different form of fame, right? There's fame that is untouchable and there's fame that's relatable. And I really wanted to lean into the latter. And I think that's where, you know, in a very, very, very small way, wherever I go, I seem to be stopped and people come up to me with an immense amount of gratitude and tears often in their eyes for the difference that my work makes. And I feel confident that I'm, you know, if there is any, I don't even like the word fame, but there's some sort of notoriety. People have heard of my work, that it's relatable, that I'm human and that I don't see myself as being better than anyone. So um, I'm glad that, you know, and I don't think that was their intention was to be better than anyone, but it's just the nature of being in Hollywood and people put you on a pedestal, you know? Yeah. And then you've kind of find yourself in a situation that I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, you're accomplished on paper. You look extremely successful. I'm sure a lot of trainers would look at you and, and would give anything to be in your position. Right. Yet mm -hmm. you're thinking to yourself, I think, I think it's time to move on. I think it's time to, to yeah. do my own thing. So talk a little bit about that moment and what was your internal dialogue like when it came to leaping out of that and into becoming, you know, working with various athletes and, and things like that, but kind of on your own terms. Yeah. You, you got all the questions, my friend. I love it. Um, <laughs> no, these are, these are really great questions. Seriously. I, I appreciate it because it speaks volumes about you as a man. And obviously we have some history as friends, but um, I, I do appreciate it because often people will jump to, you know, some of my powerful quotes and explain this, unpack that. And it's nice for somebody to ask about my own process. So that took a lot of courage, right? And I did vacillate back and forth for many nights about whether I give this very, very comfortable and for many people kind of perfect position up right you know especially in the realm of training it doesn't really get much better than that you're traveling around the world you're on g5 g6 jets you know everything's paid for you're making a lot of money you've got exposure you're getting a certain degree of press you you're you're going to premieres and you know meeting cool people and um and actually on top of all of that only working a couple of hours because how often can people work out when it's two people you know so so it really was uh, another sort of metamorphosis of my own character the evolution of my own self and i'd say very much a spiritual transition to go from something that provided security um to something that you know could say was much more a calling right so i i one of my quotes i say the only form of real security is the absence of the need for external security and even though that quote was not something that had come through me back then, I demonstrated it to myself, which is I took the leap of giving up consistent income, very comfortable income, insurance, all the things that we could want for, um, and started a business that didn't have any income. <laughs> so, but I, I, and again, I really say this with as much humility as I can, um, and it, it, you know, at this point, it doesn't matter. It's known out there, so we can say who it was. But I, you know, I knew I was my own Tom Cruise, right? Like I knew that I was my own version. You know, definitely not in acting. I suck at that. Um, but in terms of a gift, uh, a, a purpose, a a calling, um, and a presence that afforded me the confidence to make that leap you know and realize that okay i don't know how this shows up or how it's going to work out but there was a degree of trust that i had in myself that call it faith in life and the universe has got my back as i said or just similar to that 18 year old whatever resolve he had to call the school after being denied and plead his case and uh the beauty of that story is not only did they give me a place and they made me a place but Three years later, I got awarded the highest accolade from the college. <laughs> yeah, awarded to the most outstanding student of all round achievement, you know. At, at, um, at Loughborough? At Loughborough, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Did you, ha did you have clients lined up already or was this, was this complete leap of faith? And so yeah, how did no, you? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. I just knew yeah. that as much as, because to... Nicole's credit, she was very philosophical and she and I would have beautiful conversations and 
that's when I really started to see that I had a unique perspective and going back to, you know, seven years before when I was with my friend Guy or a decade before, you know, and waxing lyrical about the, the meaning of life. Um, I recognized that I could see things and it right at the end is when I went through that sort of Saturn return, you know, 29 to 31 that we all go through. That was that moment where the girl left me, you know, that was sort of right at the end of that. So that was also a catalyst for, me to take that leap because I saw the world now in a different way. I realized, wow, you know, I often quote the line from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Indiana Jones and his his girl, just the two of them, like this rough, beaten up cowboy and his girl, like, you know, up against the corporate machine of, in this case, the French archaeologist who's got all of his diggers and thousands of slaves digging in, looking for the covenant, right, the ark. And uh, he once he discovers through that light gem and the light comes through and it shows on that map on the ground, right, where it is. And he comes up and he's like, they're digging in the wrong place, right? And so I use that quote and I love it because I see that in humanity. Everyone's digging in the wrong place. And everyone is obviously a bold statement, not everyone, but the majority of people are digging in the wrong place. And what does that mean? You know, they want to acquire more money. They maybe want to get a bit of status. They want to get the bigger home. They want to get the perfect partner, the perfect body. And it's sort of this one day phenomenon. And to me, that's very much a linear progression, which is appropriate and by all means pursue it. But if you're not playing the spiritual evolution game, you're digging in the wrong place. And to me, that is a much more a linear track, right? It's, it's, it's how can I shift to a different frequency? How can, because that is the precursor to manifesting things on the material world. It's not staying at a frequency of inadequacy. I'm not loved, I'm not wanted, I'm not safe, where there's this sort of inadequacy that's driving this fear to compensate in the outside world. That's exhausting and why people are suffering and in a state of disease. And so for me, it's like when we transcend that and we step into our true divine essence, and realize our worth, our abundance, our feeling of true love that is ours, not because of someone, then that becomes the precursor to all of those things starting to show up effortlessly around us. So um, yeah, so that leap was very much that shift from seeking for the outside world to validate me, to me finding internal validation and allowing that to be the preemptive energy and frequency to a world that would reflect that. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had several of those experiences in my life. And again, I've been fortunate. I haven't lost anybody. So it hasn't happened out of trauma or out of, you know, this kind of hard knocks life type mm -hmm. of lesson about impermanence. It was more so out of curiosity for me. And yeah. I remember um, when I was in the yearbook editor in college, I know it sounds random, but it was like actually the highest paid student position in mm -hmm. college, I, I got it as a junior and you had to interview to be the editor of the yearbook. And, um, and I elected, I did a great job, right? Loved mm -hmm. it. And then I elected not to do it again as a senior, which no one could understand. Right. And I said, I'm not doing it because I just, I, I want to see what else there is in life to, to explore and to discover, not yeah. realizing it was sort of the beginning of me not being attached, of forcibly uh, surrendering my attachment to yeah. something that looked like a comfortable position, something with lots of material rewards, something with yeah. lots of recognition. And I feel yeah. like you either get there through the hard knocks approach or the curious approach. And I'm just wondering, for people listening to this who are a little bit attached to their comfortable position, yet they have this calling to do something else. Is there a way to sort of manufacture that that leap or is the leap is the leap itself the way to kind of manufacture it the first or second time both i mean i'm reminded of and i'm i might be butchering this but i think it was the roman emperor cicero and he had this quote where he said there is more glory to be won by expansion than maintenance right so in lay terms like instead of holding on to and maintaining what you have the real glory and glory in this case could be, you know, confidence, self exploration is to take that leap and expand into something that you're not familiar with. And I also I haven't seen this film, but someone told me about it. It was one of the newer Indiana Jones, I guess, having mentioned him earlier. Um, there was some scene where, you know, he's running away from the bad guys as always, and he comes to the edge of a tunnel that is a cliff face, I guess. And what happens is what is called the bridge of 
a faith or something, I don't know what it's called, but the bridge, the, the bridge is there, but you can't see it. And it only shows up when he took, takes the step. And I, I've got to find the scene so that I can uh, reference it accurately, but it's something like that, right? So, and that really speaks to that phenomenon, right? Where most people are waiting for the sign, the reassurance before they take a step, but that's not actually, there's no growth in that because that's where you're being mollycoddled. I mean, it's not to say that sometimes we don't pursue that because there is a feeling of reassurance and comfort, that's fine. But there's no growth there, right? The growth is to go beyond the comfort of what we're currently within, which is familiar, you know, and I'll often say just because something's familiar doesn't mean it's good for you, right? So um, in terms of how can people develop that? I mean, start small, you know, it could be as simple for a guy. I know for me, I was terrible at going up to girls, right? As much as I would be drawn and attracted to through my biological makeup and, you know, whatever excessive hormones I had in my systems in my 20s, you know, I, you know, just was shy. And so it might be, okay, well, don't give up your job where you're getting paid 50 to 80 grand a year yet, just because you want to start your business. But maybe, you know, talk to your dad who you haven't spoken to for a few years and try that out and uh, apologize or share something that's on your chest. Uh, if you know, using my example, if you're somebody who's drawn, you're single, but you're drawn to someone at a grocery store, you know, just take that leap of faith and go, hey, you know, I'm not very good at this. And I'm kind of embarrassed. And if you want me to go away, I will, but I'm, I'm working on something. I mean, if I was on the receiving end of that, I'd be very touched, you know. Um, so I think there's ways that we can strengthen by baby steps that. Um, and then some people are a little bit more cavalier. And they're like, fuck it, I'm leaving my family, I'm moving to the other side of the planet. <laughs> you know, I'm going to start fresh, which can often be a reaction to something. So it's not always healthy. But yeah, I, it's like anything practice, you know, and I think fundamentally, that's the external manifestation of it. But internally, it's really that sense of trust, right? Like I've often said, I'm a trust fund baby, not because I was left a penny, because I wasn't, but that I trust in the universe. And so that there are, uh, as uh, Byron Katie once had a beautiful story, she said, you know, all these people came to her event or something, and they were saying, namaste, right? But she thought they were saying no mistakes, no mistakes. You know, And she's like, they get it. There's no mistakes. <laughs> so, you know, there's no mistakes. I tell people, it doesn't matter what you do. You can't fuck it up. You know, this is a closed system. It's like a video game. Yeah, it might look like you lost the game for a minute, but don't worry. You can, you know, you can put some coins in and start over. <laughs> okay. So did you, is that when you transitioned from being sort of a body architect to becoming more of a mind architect? Yes, it was. Yeah. I started my business, started coaching, you know, really down in the trenches of just doing some hourly sessions here and there, you know, where it's like, yeah, a couple hundred bucks for a, an hour, an hour and a half session and hoping that they'd follow up and then realizing they did, but not because I was hoping, but because they were back into their sort of mechanistic habits that are going to be part of the human psyche. And especially the older people got, the more entrenched their conditioning was. And so then I was like, oh, hang on a minute, maybe we should commit to a period of time so we can start to really make some lasting change. And so, you know, it took a while, but rather than just doing one or two sessions, then I turned it into like a 90 day program or three months. And then, and then I think my big break was in 2007 when I got my first athlete, which was a PJ Tour golfer. And we had immense success in a very short space of time. So people started asking a lot of questions and that opened the floodgates to a ton of athletes. So to begin with, it was very piecemeal. I was making whatever, you know, held in comparison to what I was getting paid consistently from my training job. But it was, uh, as they say in business, that initial dip theory, which is whenever you change any operating system to begin with, productivity is going to drop, but it is for greater gain in the long run. So um, yeah, to begin with, I... You also got to see like what people, what the dominant issues, challenges... I mean, you said you you're, you don't solve problems; you dis dissolve problems. So you got to see yeah. what what people's imagined problems were, so that by the time you got to the athletes, it's like you were a well oiled, honed. You already kind of knew where to take them. You just probably had to learn their particular um, jargon. What were some of those problems? Yeah, it's a great point, and it, it's what allowed me, albeit I can still remember the discomfort I even I felt was you know sitting in a locker room with. Well, that was spring training. So there's like, you know, 70 plus major league baseball players vying for 25 spots. 
uh, commanding, you know, on the roster anywhere between one and one point eight million dollars between them, and I'm this British guy who's never fucking played baseball before <laughs> addressing them. You know, it's like talk about a fish out of water. So I for sure started to, you know, hone those skills of dissolving people's problems. Um, some of the problems in that particular case were, you know, one of my quotes I say, past hurt informs future fear, right? So wherever we as a human being have had as we do, trials and tribulations, challenges, failures, disappointments. Um, we, because our brain is designed to try and avoid that repetition, we tend to inform future fear, right? Uh, one of my favorite stories was an NBA guy who had the worst free throw shooting average. You know, this is a few years ago now. And of course, his future fear was, I don't want to miss, right? I'm sitting in his kitchen and um, he's shooting 35% or something. League average is 30, uh, 75, so he's less than half. And um, I told him, I said, well, yeah, I could see that you're trying not to miss and that's creating fear, anxiety. It's seeping into his everyday life, his relationships, all the things and the embarrassment he feels and the crowds booing and he's getting paid millions of dollars not to do that. And, um, and I said, well, what if I told you that for the rest of the season, you know, you shock league average and he just sort of had the biggest smile on his face. He's like, that'd be epic. But, you know, how do we do that? And I said, well, I mean, I just made up a new future that's way better than yours. We're still sitting in your fucking kitchen, right? But that could be the place to start to look is how are you perceiving what's going to happen and start to consciously create a future that you can step into. So, yeah, I definitely was in places that if you told me when I was a kid, you know, that that's where I'd be, I'd be like, you're joking. You know, it's like um, I could maybe talk to some soccer players, but I'm not going to talk to a bunch of baseball players who are chewing tobacco, <laughs> You know, um, but it was nonetheless the same principles applied, right? Which is human beings who at the deepest level want to be loved and accepted. It's like that little kid within all of us that doesn't want to disappoint, that doesn't want to, to fail. And sometimes that becomes the biggest obstacle because we're so focused on what we don't want that we are neglecting to focus on what we do want. And um, so whether you're a baseball player, uh, a PGA tour player, an Olympic athlete or a multi-billionaire, the same principles of how our subconscious tends to sabotage our dreams and aspirations were at play. And I was able to dissolve those. I know you studied Ayurveda, um, which is a holistic approach to wellness. Yeah. And from, from seeing all of your work online and your viral clips, it seems like that's a through line is there's a holistic approach, right? The way you think about mm -hmm. one thing is usually going to be reflected in other things that you're doing or other things that you're thinking about. And I'm curious, um, when you first started coaching people and, and talking about these things, how much of it was you creating your own framework, your own universe of how these things go, like literally intentionally sitting down and whiteboarding it all out or writing it all out? How much of it was just intuitive? Like you just, you would, because this, this happens to me all the time. You know, after yeah. all these years of writing and teaching and speaking, people will ask me a question and I'll just, I'll get this feeling like, say this, and I say yeah. it. And it's like the most beautiful, elegant thing mm -hmm. you could have said that yeah. I can't, even, I don't even know if I can take authorship of it, but yeah. it's, it's exactly what they needed to hear. And I'm just yeah. curious how much of that you were experiencing in those early days. Relative to say studying Ayurveda, you mean, or? Well, because just, I know you were doing that in addition to yeah. everything else. So I'm sure that informed, um, you know, how you were, you were teaching and coaching. For sure. And I think, you know, I would be the first to express gratitude to life, to people, to studies that have all in their own way to whatever degree, some minor, some major contributed to my own insights and my own ability to do what I do. I would say predominantly it's the former in terms of just for whatever reasons, tapped into the cosmic database of insights, like the traditional Indian seers, right? The gurus who they weren't like on their iPads, you know, <laughs> they were, they were tapped into the universal wild, wide web, you know, and they downloaded. And I feel like you, sometimes I'll be doing my mastermind, for example, my three month, like the most powerful process I take people through this brilliant container where I teach my methodology and I coach people and then help them understand what I'm doing. There are times when I say things that I will literally almost like a timestamp for my team. I'll say, I couldn't say that any better. Right. So it's almost like they capture that because 
it's like Mozart, you know, like for me, the use of words, the combination of words, the intonation that are using uh, me, you know, to come out in a way that sounds like music to other people. And it transcends, as I said earlier, traditional thinking that allows somebody to have maybe heard something similar, but in a way now just lands and truly shifts the course of their whole trajectory of life. So I can't claim authorship to that either. Uh, and I'm very comfortable with that. You know, I'm a beneficiary of it. And again, one of my quotes, I say, as we express, so we experience, right? So if we express hatred, well, guess what you're feeling? When I express love, guess what you're feeling? And as I express insights, then I'm equally the beneficiary of those. And I literally sometimes when I'm with clients, I have to write down what I just said to them because I'm like, I want to reference that for myself later. So I would say the majority of things that I share, and certainly this um, formula for, you know, awakening is a strong word, but self-realization and freeing the mind and liberating the soul is very much um, something I've tapped into. You know, it's not people are like, where did you study? I'm like, you know, life, the universe. Then, of course, what's been nice is things like Ayurveda, which is, you know, certainly supersedes me as five, 6,000 year old science. What I was able to then do was to see the correlations between some of those insights, obviously most to do with physiology and the energies of our body and the doshas, but how they relate to some of the things that I speak to, that was just a beautiful point of confirmation more than something that I repeated, you know, it was just, oh, okay, I'm on the right track. What are some of the tenets of, of, mind architecture when you talk about being a mind architect yeah um, what, what are some of the things you you teach so really one of the main distinctions is to make the subtle difference but equally massive difference between what i call 1.0 mindset which is what we could call ego or persona and then this new era of humanity that i speak to which we could call soul or spirit right so these are somewhat everyday uh, words that are part of people's lexicon, um, but really delineating them and understanding that they are part of our humanity. And so I break down human being, for example, as the beginning of my mastermind. I say the human is the hardware, the human is the mind and the, uh, sorry, the body and the brain. And then the being is the soul and the spirit. And the mind is kind of the bridge between the two, right? You know, with all your work and meditation and yoga, that they look at the koshas, like the different levels, right? And so what I'm working on is something I call the perceiving self, which is our own identity. And then we have the soul, the perceiving self is the bridge. And then we have the, the faculties of our equipment, right? If you get into a Range Rover, you're going to have a different experience in terms of what's available to you than if you get into like a beaten up old Honda Civic, right? So, but you as the quote unquote driver are intact. There's nothing missing but the degree to which you get to express yourself and create based on the equipment is why it's important for me to take care of this meat suit. That's why Ayurveda was such a beautiful supplement to my work. So really what I'm looking at is in the tenets of mind architecture is to go, okay, by default, my, my assertion, Peter Crone's assertion is that we have 10 prisons that we all arrive with. And that's what's going to be the foundation of my book. So if you were to ask, what's the 10, I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. <laughs> you 10 prisons or prisons? Pri prisons, constraints, okay. limitations. Okay. And some of them we transcend just by virtue of maturity. We go through hard knocks and we realize we get a little help. We talk to a therapist. We talk to a friend. We talk to a priest, whatever it is. And we may be just through our own um, growth, you know, transcend. But some really define us. So, for example, one that everyone can relate to, one of the prisons is the feeling of not being enough. It's an inherent part of the ego that by design, it feels insufficient. Now, you may not have had a parent who berated you or criticized you for getting a B as opposed to A, as much as that's a very uh, stereotypical uh, archetype for kids. Uh, one of my athletes, baseball players, he would go four for five, which is a baseball player's epic. You know, you're batting 800. If you're a 300, you know, you're a Hall of Famer, but he would still still to seem miserable. And, you know, I would investigate. And I was like, why, why are you down? You just, you, you were basically the MVP of the game. And he's like, well, you know, it just reminds me of my dad. He would always say, what happened to the fifth a bat? Like, why didn't you get it? You know, so you can start to see that that not enoughness is insidious. It's part of the human psyche. We can all relate to it. A girl isn't pretty enough. A guy isn't strong enough or tall enough or wealthy enough. You know, a girl doesn't have boobs aren't big enough or wh whatever it is. The not enoughness is it's, uh, it's, it's replete in the human 
condition. And so mind architecture is when I worked with someone, they would tell me whatever they're dealing with. It could be a physiological issue. They could be sick. They could have a relationship problem. They could have a, uh, uh, an emotional s sort of feeling of depression, anxiety, whatever it is. Um, they could have financial problems. And what I do is I reverse engineer whatever the problem is into one of these prisons, sometimes two. And so as I reveal... Because whatever we're conscious of is an extension of what we're not conscious of. So the subconscious prison or constraint is the genesis for the thoughts, feelings, actions, and outcomes, right? If people follow that, that cascade, who we are at the deepest level for ourselves is what creates how we think, feel, consequently, the choices and behaviors we have, which always gives rise to the results we get, right? And if you understand that, it's very powerful. When we go and see an expert, most people focus on actions. Well, don't do this, do that, right? So you're sort of too far downstream because you might be able to sustain that for a while if you have willpower, like trying to quit smoking, quit drinking, like don't do this and do that. But they don't understand that at the deepest level in their subconscious, who they are for themselves is not good enough. They're not loved. They're not wanted. Something in the not bucket, N-O-T, which is a resistance to self, which creates suffering, and then we seek to escape suffering. In this case, those examples might be nicotine or alcohol. So unless you deal with the deep prison, then at best, you might get temporary relief because of willpower or shame, you know, because your partner is making you wrong for something. So mind architecture is really getting to the root cause of these psychological constraints and limitations, and through investigation, uh, negating the validity of them, meaning to see that they're not true. Like if I were to open up light, you know, where am I going to find this not good enough? It doesn't exist as part of your hardware. It is simply a conversation. And so when people see that, the epiphanies that arise are just so moving, along with often a lot of emotion, right? Because they may maybe been living in this world for 30, 40 years, confined, and they have the people-pleasing perfectionism as a coping strategy, which is now creating their Hashimoto's because they're exhausted from trying too hard, blah, blah, blah. And then they realize it's all built on this very, very shaky foundation of some feeling of inadequacy. So I pull the carpet from beneath their whole persona and reveal this new world of, you know, pure possibility. And ultimately my main product, as you know, which is freedom. Yeah. A lot of people, I'm sure you've had this experience, you know, you post some really profound clip online and you'll yeah. get a comment where someone completely misread it or misinterpreted it. And they send you this long thing and you can see clearly like a children's book. Oh, you made this assumption and that assumption. And those were two very incorrect assumptions. Correct. So when it comes to uh, liberating ourselves from this, these prisons, is that self investigation? Do you teach how to do that on your own or does one need as a facilitator in order to transcend their own blind spots? Again, great question. I, I don't think, you know, need is a word that's based in resistance. And that's part of my mastermind where I speak about certain words carry limitations themselves. So if you need to do something, then you're already in a state of fight or flight. So you don't need a facilitator, but I would say, and I would argue for the fact that that is the beauty of relationship, right? Everything in life is based on relativity. If I'm lying in bed and I'm hot, and if I move my leg, I feel the cold sheets. It's only relative to where I was. And so that's why relationships to me are so pivotal and so powerful because it's through relationship with another human that our idiosyncrasies come to the surface so that we can transcend them. Now, not everybody is a good facilitator, right? Not everybody knows how to listen. Some people have their own biases. They have their own agendas that they want to superimpose. They're trying to sell pharmacology you know, products or whatever it is to meet their you know, quarterly uh, budgets. Um, so... I think it's it's helpful if you have someone who knows how to listen or a community, which is what I've created with my masterminds and my uh, my membership freedom so that you are held in a way that doesn't feel judged, that you can share transparently and vulnerably. And then you just through your own awareness, that's when you can do some of your self-reflection and go, holy shit, I have for 30 years really felt that I wasn't lovable. You know, and we can have compassion for that, you know, but the, my excuse was, oh, there's no good women in New York, or there's no good guys in Chicago. And like, that was the way that I protected myself from my own hurt of thinking that I'm not lovable. So it, I think it helps to start with to get counsel support. Once you understand the mechanistic nature of the subconscious and these constraints, then you can start to through your own faculty of realizing, oh, if I'm triggered by something, if I'm upset, if I'm suffering, there's something that I'm missing. 
And that's one of my more famous, you know, quotes or popular quotes. I say, life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. So that then, if you've gotten a little bit of a head start, a little bit of counsel, you know, a little bit of help, understand the mechanism of the human ego, then just live life. And wherever you get presented with people in life and circumstances to reveal where you're not free, meaning you get pissed off, upset or uh, down, then there's something that you're not recognizing that's in the way of your own magnificence and divinity. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Yeah. I've heard you uh, talk about suffering and as opposed to pain. Yeah. And um, so what's the ultimate um, objective with liberation what is what is the is it an experience of presence is it more is it more fulfillment is it just the absence of suffering how would you articulate that i think all the above i mean i'm going to default to my favorite word which is freedom it's total freedom but with that there's all of these bedfellows of experiences right so for me i again share in the mastermind that if you're totally free then what you start to really tap into is the essence of your own sense of love and when you're in that space, you also start to see the world in a different way where you truly see nothing but possibility. And then from that place, you start to feel in your body a sense of vitality. And then in your relationships, because of that precursor, the cascade continues and you start to feel real connection with people, right? So the, the system that I created, it's so beautiful in terms of these 10 prisons, because as you sort of like whack-a-mole, as you deal with one, it opens up the spiritual characteristic that's on the other side of the constraint and they cascade into this very virtuous cycle versus a vicious cycle right so if i'm living in a world where i feel separate where i don't think i'm enough well then i'm going to be in a state of suffering what's that going to show up as in my body disease at some point if i'm a state of dis-ease then my ability to relate and have intimacy with people is compromised my ability to have abundance is definitely compromised and so we go into this spiral of you know, basically leaving what looks like a normal life, right? Where eventually I get old, I get sick and shit doesn't work out. What I'm exposing is the antithesis of that, which is this entirely new world where I'm living from my fundamental inherent sense of freedom. And then the cascade of these beautiful spiritual qualities or soul characteristics start to come online. And uh, there is absolute joy with that true peace. So that is the absence of suffering. And in the absence of suffering, I would assert that what you find is true freedom, love, and possibility. And just to kind of paint a real world picture of what that could actually look like, yeah. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm coming away with is you're in, you, you do your best. You are excellent in the way that you show up in in life. You know, obviously on a spectrum, um, and maybe you fall in love with someone, but it doesn't work out, and it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's not a thing where you're you're seeing um, them as a bad person or you as a victim and you can kind of move on and you go into a business arrangement. It looks great. It doesn't work out. It's okay. You don't have yeah. to project the thing that's not happening onto whatever is around you. You can more easily sort of recenter and stay present focused as opposed yeah. to regretful about what didn't happen or worried about what may happen in the future. Yeah, or blameful towards somebody or circumstance. Absolutely. So that's one iteration, right? Which would be for most people, a real big step in evolution of being a much more powerful human being, right? I'm no longer a victim of circumstance. I'm not pissed off at my wife or my husband because they left me and now I'm talking to their attorney and we're squabbling over air miles, right? No, that's the very, you know, insecure way of living where it's basically a child having a tantrum, right? Like I am at the effect of somebody else's choices. That's never going to work out. That's, you know, hatred is a curved blade. And that's where people sort of superimpose their own suffering onto somebody else. So that is one iteration where you mitigate all of that suffering by realizing, okay, this isn't necessarily what I wanted. This was a beautiful relationship. And if they chose to leave you, perhaps there could be naturally a subjective feeling of, you know, loss or sadness and grief, but they wouldn't come with anger and judgment and blame and accusations, right? So that would be an evolutionary step. 
And then the same with a career. If you got laid off from work, you know, you wouldn't necessarily go into despair and destruction or of being vindictive um, or, you know, bad mouthing your employer or something like that. You'd be like, okay, I'm going to be fully responsible for why is this happening? Because life is trying to show me something. In this case, it could be you're playing too small. You know, you've been talking about starting a business for a decade, but you're scared and you've been holding on to this security of a monthly check. But really, life is like you're ready, you know, and we're, we're going to jettison you from this company, not because you did anything wrong, but be, we want you to step into your greatness. So then that would be a new way of relating to life. What I would say, the more evolved evolution of that is not only would you not have a reaction to something like that, you wouldn't even attract it in the first place. Right? And that's not to say that everything is just rainbows and unicorns. You know, we don't want to be Mr. Kumbaya too much. But when you really understand the depths of abundance and value and self-worth and love and freedom that we have at the essence of who we are, then that frequency, just like any old-fashioned radio sitting on your kitchen table, dialed in tends to attract the music and the tones that are appropriate for that. So yes, it may not be a sort of everlasting relationship, but it was beautiful and you're both grateful for it. And it might not be a job or a client that you know is the quintessential, but you really appreciate that's exactly what I needed for right now. And then I'm going to move on to the next milestone. So it is the absence of reaction and it is leaning more into the co-creation that I'm a conscious being who as best as I can is discerning the way that I want to in a disciplined way, but also in a trusting way, manifest the circumstances of my life that are for my greatest good. Yeah. yeah and when you, when you spend more than 10 minutes scrolling on social media, you're going to come across, you know, so many different quotes telling you, you're not doing this right. You're not seeing this situation correct. You need to do the work. You need to become this. You need to, you know, when it comes to this concept of doing the work as it relates to mind architecture and liberating ourselves, what are some of the daily practices? If you could share, uh, just, just if someone's listening to this and they resonate yeah. with everything we're saying, is there anything they can do on a daily basis to kind of put themselves in a pole position for yeah. this level of growth and liberation? Great question. Um, I think the first thing to do is recognize the game that I'm talking about, right? The spiritual evolution game versus the human progression game. So meaning, you know, recognize that you're either playing one or the other. And we can oscillate between the two. It's fine to try and amass more money or get a bigger home or find a better looking partner or chisel your body. These are all great, right? But if it's out of context, meaning if you don't understand the bigger game of foot, which is I'm here to evolve and to basically break free, like that to me is the game of why we're here, why we incarnated. So that's the first thing to look at is if you're caught up in very much the material world, and I don't mean that in the very, you know, sort of a gratuitous form of just cash and bling, but really just like I'm trying to manage my circumstances, then you're already off base, right? It's like, okay, Here's the opportunity. If I'm here to grow and evolve as a being and to recognize my own divinity, which is boundless, timeless, and limitless, where do I currently feel the antithesis of that, right? Where do I feel frustrated? Who am I not talking to? Who am I blaming for my circumstances? These are all treasure troves, right? This is where I'm pretending to be a victim. So that's the first place to start, is where do you have some narrative that your life circumstances are because of something or someone else? And start to realize that's just not true. It's just not true. You have, and sometimes, and this, by the way, does not condone behavior. Sometimes people go through horrific things. You know, people are abused sexually, emotionally, physically, taken advantage of financially. It really feels like you're a victim of something. But I would even invite people in that, in those very challenging, tragic situations to realize at some level, not consciously, you are curating these experiences because there's something for you to garner and learn from. So once, so that's the first thing to see is where are you being a victim versus where are you being 100% responsible? And it is an on-off switch. It's not like a gradient. You're either fully responsible or you're not. And if you're not, then you're saying that you're at the effect of life and that's a very powerless place to live. So that's where we have to start. Mm -hmm. Then as best as you can, start with the low-hanging fruit. 
you know, you're pissed off with a friend, somebody who you really love and they love you, but because of some disagreement, they started dating an ex or whatever bullshit story on the surface that's upsetting you. Do you really want to make them wrong for that? Or are you willing to step into a more evolved person and have that conversation and say, hey, I apologize. I've been judging you and making you wrong because at some level I get a payoff, right? Again, one of my quotes, I say, making someone else wrong or being right is the poor man's version of self-worth, mm. right? So that's where you can start to see I'm being kind of childish here. I'm not talking to my dad and my mom because, you know, I think it's their fault that I didn't go to the right college or I wasn't loved enough or they, whatever it is, it's just playing small. So for me, that's the place to start in the daily is look at where am I being a victim where versus where am I being responsible? And then it's a progression, you know, chip away at the areas you're being a victim with whom and with what circumstances. And sometimes we need help. You know, if I'm being a victim of my finances, you may have good reason, you know, most people's victimhood mindset does have good rationalization. You might need some support. You might need a little bit of a boost and in investment. You might need a friend to help you out. You might need a financial colleague to give you some advice. That's okay. But don't stay in your story of like, you know, I'm never going to make it or what's the point or, you know, I'm never going to be wealthy. Like these are all just stories. You know, I, I can remember and someone I spoke to a client this morning and I cited this one of my first it was actually my second golfer. After he'd seen the success I'd had with one, all these golfers started lining up. And the second guy I worked with, he, um, you know, started to have quick success within about two or three months. And he sent me this text and he said, I just got it. I just got what you've been telling me. It just comes down to whoever's got the best imagination. Hmm. And that's why I love, and I even have a company called Abracadabra, because as you may may know but abracadabra we obviously associate with magicians they pull out the rabbit blah 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 and it's abracadabra but the hebrew translation of magic real magic is as i speak so i create hmm. I that's what that. abracadabra means mm -hmm. so if you really want to be a powerful human being then start to truly be responsible for the way that you speak because your words are creating the container for the life that you're living wow that's beautiful i love that so I'm going to wade over into a little bit of sort of tricky territory here. Let's go. Um, talking about conventional therapy. I, I saw yeah. a therapist once and, mm -mm. you know, I've been doing my own work and reconciling and taking responsibility. And she's, obviously she wants to talk about my childhood. Yeah. My parents were up to what they did, what they didn't do. And I kind of had a, what I thought was a healthy way of sort of relating to the whole thing. Right. Like they were doing yeah. the best they can, blah, blah, blah. And she yeah. kept shifting the conversation back to no, no, no. They were abusive. You were a victim, blah, blah, blah. I didn't resonate with it. I didn't yeah. stop. I didn't continue seeing her after a couple more sessions. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious mm -hmm. about the mind architecture perspective in general on therapy and, and how can we use therapy for liberation as opposed to uh, doubling down on this, these stories that mm -hmm. a lot of people um, are being indoctrinated with by by some of the therapists who may not be as talented i mean look it's how long's a piece of string right like it's like you could talk about private chefs to private trainers to you know yoga teachers like it's so hard to say because there are some brilliant therapists right there are some incredible yoga teachers and then there are the yoga teachers that are sleeping with 18 year old girls and below you know there are therapists who equally are just trying to make more money by pushing, you know, benzodiazepines and the Wellbutrins and the Prozacs and whatever. Um, so it's, it's so hard to say. The good news is no mistakes. Namaste, right? Like meaning wherever somebody's at right now and whoever you're in front of, you are going to be presented with whatever's appropriate for you. So you can't not be in the right place. It doesn't mean that the circumstances are ideal or what you want or even comfortable, um, you know. Um, so I think it's all valid. It's all lessons. It's all life trying to help us to evolve. And if right now somebody's with a therapist, I know somebody I know has been with a therapist forever and they find comfort in the familiar. But I also feel it's a disservice to their growth, right? It's an attachment therapy right, where there's the therapist starts to become more like a friend and they justify your opinions versus perhaps investigating in them and maybe, you know, 
not to invalidate them, but to help you transcend them, right? Because it's like any friend, a really good friend will have as part of the tenant of their commitment to the friendship, a bit of tough love about them, right? Which is pull your head out of your ass, you know, versus those yes people around us. And sometimes they become the professionals we hire are really more intent on keeping you as a consistent client versus, as I often said at the beginning of my career, you know, I said, the greatest gift you can give me is when you tell me that you don't need me anymore. But that takes some bulls, right? And really is a stand for what I believe, which is, as I tell people again, I can't give you something you don't already have. I'm just here to help you remove what's in the way of you seeing that. What, what's an average amount of time that someone does work with you until they get to that point where they can kind of run the, the program on their own? Oh, it varies. In my mastermind, I might work with someone for 15 minutes, you know, and they see something they can't unsee. Now, depending on their age, they might need reinforcement. And that's why the community is there to help. But, you know, and I mean, I've got one of my baseball players who was an MVP of the whole National League, which is the biggest accolade he could get. He's worked with me for 15 years. So, you know, it's, it's, it just depends, right? Uh, it's not that he has any problems, because you've got the the sort of scale, right? If we could talk about people dealing with real trauma, real suffering, real constraints. But once you break out of that world and you step into this world of freedom, there's a whole new world to explore, right? So it's one thing to be in a reactive state where I'm trying to avoid things, but it's a completely different proposition to become a human being who's now truly exploring potential. So uh, I've got clients who just, okay, they overcame their shortcomings, their illusions of constraint and their prisons. And they're like, fucking A, now I'm ready to go. You know, I'm not trying to like hide my my flaws and my imperfections. I realized I don't have any. I just had a story of inadequacy or insecurity about myself. And now that I've transcended that, I'm free. What else can we do here on this planet? You know, so it, the timeline is it's really up to the individual and what they're committed to. Sometimes it comes down to simple resources. It, sometimes it comes down to, Hey, you know, you, you, you started me on training wheels, you took them off. I'm riding like a champ and I'm going to see how far I can go without you. And I'm like, have at it. You know, um, it's also why I created this community again of freedom so that people can stay in a conversation, even if they're in a great place, because it's, you know, I tell people in my mastermind with all due love, I say, you know, we're a bunch of freaks in here. I hope you understand that, right? We're really committed to breaking free, to loving each other, to not making each other wrong, to truly seeing a world of possibility. That's that's not what you're going to get at your local Starbucks. You know, you're going to get people who are pissed off because you cut in line and there's animosity on the roads. And, you know, so I think it's important to have a container, whether it's your local church or your local community event, where you feel this sense of intimacy and camaraderie so that we can keep to push forward this world of, you know, true freedom, love and possibility and vitality, as I say. So, you know, whatever means, if it's therapy, if it's friends, if it's your local priest, if it's a life coach, or it's fine, you know, it's where you're at. But it, I know that even for myself, look at sports, right? You might start as a junior golfer and you, you know, you have your local high school coach helps you or even your dad. And then eventually, you know, that doesn't work. And your buddy who's a scratch player at college, he starts to step in and then maybe you get better and then you need a professional coach. You know, there's evolution. So maybe someone does need a, a basic friend right now just to listen to without judgment. And then maybe they'll go a little deeper with a great therapist and maybe they'll stay with that therapist for a while. And then maybe they'll get a psychiatrist or maybe they'll get, you know, I, I don't know, you know, but uh, I'm grateful certainly for the people that find inspiration in my work. I'm not the be all end all. There's a many, many means of finding freedom through different roads to Rome. And there's a lot of great people out there who lend great insight. So I'm just always flattered by the people that choose to sort of jump in my classes and, and uh, find freedom through my methods. Yeah, it, we're both kind of in the root cause business. And I'm sure yeah. we both have seen over the years that it's definitely a harder sell when you're selling root root cause versus the band aid, the quick fix, the shortcut. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. What well, what are some sort of creative ways that you have presented this information that you feel does kind of break through the traditional sort of shortcut marketing, you know, tactics that a lot of people use who who um, are luring people in with, hey, you can change overnight and all you have to yeah. do is do these three things. I think what I've relied on more than anything is my own authenticity. You know, that I'm not, I'm not, I'm really shitty at sales, right? Like it's not my forte. And so I think like anything, as much as it's an old 
an old business model mine relies very much on word of mouth so you know when there's a few hundred people from all around the world in one of my masterminds and they're blown away in ways that for 40 years they've been trying to get over anxiety depression or whatever and they're just like holy shit like they can't not tell their loved ones and family and then they're like well when's the next one i want to be in that you know and so these are people i mean i was just in cancun as i said at this retreat and i probably got stopped by 40 people that i've never met before in my life one guy literally was crying and shaking something guy in his 50s he said you have no idea you probably saved my life you know so i I think it's like anything in life. We can only express ourselves to the best ability with the greatest of intent and hopefully with some sort of degree of authenticity. And it lands where it lands. I'm sure some people hear me and go, this guy's, you know, hey, what are his qualifications or he's full of shit or, you know, fortunately I don't get much of that. But um, I just trust that the people that are meant to hear what I have to say and are inspired by what I share will find a way of connecting with me, whether it's just, you know, at some point my book comes out, maybe they start there. Maybe they join Freedom for 29 bucks a month because it's super affordable. Maybe they join my mastermind. Eventually I'm going to have a school. You know, these are just different levels of engagement. Um, and maybe just this podcast alone is enough for somebody hopefully to have a shift. So, you know, I I don't try to be anyone other than who I am. And I rely on the the goodness of my intent. And I know that because I went through this to go back to some of your earlier questions of my genesis of how I went through things. I can remember in another breakup, um, I really broke down and it was a very trying time for me, not the story of loss. Cause that really happened, you know, when I was 29 with that first girlfriend, but this was more the story of not being enough for me. That was one of the prisons that came to the surface. She was a bit younger and she started dating a, a, a dude in college. And I was like, Holy shit. You know, in my mind, I'm like, he's going to be more of a stud and fitter and data, all of this. Right. And it really got to me. And then I realized, you know, one of my things that upset me the most was how caring I was. And I saw it as a weakness, you know, cause this guy was more, whatever, you know, a college dude didn't give a shit. And, and I saw my caring as a weakness, as I said, and then I realized I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, Holy shit. Like my caring is a superpower. Right. That's not something to judge myself for, but rather something to be proud of and to enhance. And I think from that moment forth, I realized I'm not here to manipulate people. I'm not here to take advantage of people. The amount of above and beyonds that I do, you know, both for paid events, unpaid events, the number of prison prisoners that I've given free courses to because they'll never have access to my work through this um, compassion project charity that we work with. You know, I know I care and I'm I'm okay with that, you know. So if people find solace in my work, great. If they go somewhere else, great. I'm I'm not gonna take it personally. So yes, I I know that people would love it if I said, Hey, this is how you get rid of anxiety, you know, because then the four, five hundred million people who deal with anxiety, it's like, oh, that's me. And we use some of that terminology because obviously we need to connect with what people struggle with. But I'm not interested in helping you with your anxiety. I'm helping you understand why you have it, you know. So I trust and so far so good the last few years being on beautiful podcasts like with you, my friend, and great questions seems to be reaching sufficient amount of people who are willing to take a, a look at some of the deeper attributes of what it is to be human and how difficult that can be at times and find some relief and, and certainly keeps me busy. <laughs> beautiful, man. I think that's a great place to end it. I appreciate you. Um, it's been wonderful catching up with you again after all these years and, uh, yeah. and again, watching you and your message get bigger and bigger and just more relatable to so many people. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to spread your message in my community and, and, and hopefully far beyond. Thank you, my friend. It's really a joy to reconnect. I miss you. And, uh, I'm also happy for everything that you're doing and all the books you're getting out there and the people you're reaching with your own version of caring you know the world needs more of that in a world that seems right now to be uh somewhat saturated with the absence of care <laughs> so <laughs> we'll keep fighting the good fight and um you know those who are ready to to join us in a world of as i said freedom love possibility and vitality versus the current world of limitation fear suffering and disease you know i'm here for it
Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.